Welcome to CFO Chat. This is a platform where we talk matters corporate actions as and when they develop. And today we're privileged to have Rispa Genga, the Chief Financial Officer and Head of Strategy at EABL. So Rispa, looking at the EABL numbers, the top line looks extremely resilient, particularly in view of the circumstances. The bottom line not as rosy, and I think the cost element is what comes here. The indication is that EABL, unlike other peers in the market, has not been as aggressive in terms of cost rationalization. Why is this the case? So I think there's three, or three different aspects to this. The first one is when you look at our balance sheet, you will see of, that of around about 100 billion in total assets, 60% of that is fixed assets, which tells you that you've got a significant plant which you need to keep in production for you to, to mitigate the fixed cost absorption impact. So you need the volumes to come through, cover your fixed costs, and then mitigate the variable. So in the first instance, when you get to a place like COVID, you can't just shut the plant and walk away and the cost goes away. So the first thing you have to do is get your brands moving, um, invest behind them, and so advertising and promotion comes in. Invest in execution, so your salespeople going out and selling actively, and that helps you to use up the plant and pay off your fixed costs, and then you know that mitigates the gross margins and helps you to come back strong. And if you look at our numbers up to the gross margin level, they're really quite strong. They're back to F20 levels and quickly approaching the F19 levels. So that, that's telling. The second aspect is, uh, as I said, advertising and promotion is really critical. It's an investment behind our brands. That, what, that is what drives the top line. So again, even in COVID times, that's something that we have been very strategic around saying for our sales to come back, for that throughput to go through, we really do have to spend in, uh, on the advertising and spend. And then we focused on cutting down the discretionary spend. But again, as you will see, one of the things we always talk about is that even through COVID, we want to make sure that we are a company that has a strong look back reputation. That when we look back on the decisions that we made, have they been good for the shareholder? Have they been good for the employees? Have they been good for the community? So when we look at that lens, then that drives the decisions we take. Because if we laid off all our salespeople because the trade is closed, when it came back, then we're going to struggle to kickstart the engines. So we took the decision to keep them, keep them working in different ways. And when the trade opened, maximize the output from them. So I think those are the three things. The last one, one-off costs, we've talked about them before. We've had some legacy tax cases. We've dealt with them in this financial year. And I think if you take those off the cost line, our profit would have grown 28%. So that tells you we've still got a very strong underlying performance. Okay. But then considering what you've said, where does that leave EABL from an operational efficiency standpoint in terms of the balance between your revenues and your costs? How is an investor meant to look at the counter when they're taking a decision? So I think first we have trimmed our costs. So if I look at, for instance, the admin line, uh, that has grown 9% year on year. But you remember last year, the office was closed, the salespeople weren't going out, you know, everything was shut down. So whilst it's 9% up year on year, it's minus 1% on F19. So that tells you on what is discretionary, we really cut down on that. And we're really quite firm around even extracting efficiency out of that. Secondly, when you also look at um, just the way inflation is moving, as well as the supply chain disruption has meant that goods get pricier. But we always put a target on what we call productivity. And that means that with everything, you don't just grow it by inflation. Actually, you challenge yourself to grow below inflation on a cost perspective. So that's one of the things we've done. And we challenge ourselves consistently. And that has helped to mitigate our numbers. So when you look at it from that perspective, I think we are quite strong on cost. We've taken out a lot of cost from the system. But as I say, we have to invest on two big things. The quality of our plant is the quality of our product. The quality of our advertising and promotion is the investment in our brands, and that gives us a return. From a major perspective, we don't necessarily look at ourselves from cost-income ratio, as I would have done in the banking sector. I look at my overhead rate, because overhead is discretionary cost. I also look at my gross margin. So if my gross margin is strong, then I'm sustaining you know, good fixed cost absorption, keeping my costs in check. So if I'm growing gross margin, then I'm doing really well. Then I come down to advertising and promotion. That's one where actually the focus is on increasing because that's the investment behind your brand. So if you cut down on that in any company of our, our industry, 
cutting down on ANP is, is detrimental. So that we look at growing. And then we look at the other costs and the overheads and we always say that has got to be below 10% and that's the benchmark for efficiency for us. So it's to get that below 10% to be able to fund and drive the advertising and that really translates to the top and the bottom line. EABL closed FY21 in an extremely cash-rich position. I mean, you have about 4.4 billion shillings you're sitting on, and this is compared to just 1.4 billion in the previous financial year. The surprise here is that you did not extend a dividend, never mind the sort of liquidity you're sitting on. Some shareholders would look at this and think it wasn't the right call. Well, that was a very, very intense uh, conversation, as you can imagine. And we, again, as I said, we think about the shareholder. We think about them not just for today, but about what is good for them for the long-term growth of this business. So we took into account three major things. One was the environment. Uh, we were reporting at a time when Uganda was on a 42-day most aggressive lockdown we've seen in these times. Kenya was on a sort of partial lockdown in some parts of the country and reduced trading hours. And what we've seen in the current environment is the volatility is still there. We've not uh, overcome COVID. The waves are still coming in. And as and when we get vaccines completely or at a good level across East Africa, then is when we will have some level of confidence that these shutdowns um, are not going to come, come in. And we need to be very, very prepared when they do come. So we're a cash rich business, but that means if the cash doesn't come in, you know, you've got to be ready for it. So, so that's one, just keeping our eye on the macros. The second piece was we have invested even in this time. You know, we've invested in a gene explosion. Those are in triple digit growth. Uh, we've invested in Serengeti Brewing, a business that has, you know, the margins are expanding. The top line is in double digits for two years continuously. So we think those are the right things for the shareholder. The third thing we've done with the money that we've generated, we've expanded capacity in Uganda, and you can see uh, the top line coming through at 33%. And that was just, we were held back by capacity. So putting in capacity in there, again, you know, at a time of such uncertainty, we believe is the right thing for the shareholder. And if we don't do that, then, you know, they, we're, not, we're not taking the right calls by just paying out the cash. Finally, we think that um, once we have navigated particularly the capex spend and a little more settled around um, the COVID situation, then I think we should be able to get back to sustainable dividend payment. We don't want to be unpredictable. I think stability for shareholders is very important, that they know what to expect from us, that when we come back to dividend pay, they know that we've done the right things that will keep that sustainable. I was combing through EABL numbers going back as far as FY1617 and the indication is that uh, Kenya as a share of the revenue pie has fallen from a high of 75%, it's now about 66%. And the question here is, barring COVID-19, is there a deliberate effort by EABL to deconcentrate the business away from Kenya? So I would use a slightly different uh, terminology. One is that the share, you know, the, the size of the cake is growing. So back in F17, we were at about 70 billion. Uh, barring COVID, I think we'd be probably in the 90s by now. Uh, we're at 86 billion this year. So the cake is growing, but there are areas where you're growing faster. Uh, than others. So for Kenya, we really have a mature business. We still think there's opportunity if you look at the gin um, explosion that we've done, if you look at the alcohol penetration levels, they're still quite low. So we think there's growth there. But when you look at uh, Uganda and Tanzania, those represent for us even bigger growth opportunities. So we think that you'll grow faster in those uh, even as you grow Kenya. But also secondly, even just thinking about our markets, you know, some of the volatilities that come whenever we have an election or any kind of instability in any of the economies, I think it's very important from a portfolio perspective to be well diversified and that's what we're looking at doing. Looking at how much the Uganda business pulled its weight in terms of propping the FY21 numbers and if you consider the sort of COVID situation that is unraveling in the country right now and the sort of measures being taken by way of restricted movement and operations, what's your outlook like in terms of the next 12 months in terms of performance? 
Well, with COVID, the word outlook just becomes very difficult, I think we all have to say, because you think you're, you get in there and then you get a new wave. So, but one thing I will say, we've been in the different waves through, through the last year or so, and we always draw the graph showing, you know, here's a wave and you can actually see uh, the sails coming up and down. But what we've learned is whilst we can't control when the waves come, when the waves come and what action will be taken, we can control everything else. We can control um, how we show up in the market, our variety of products, how we execute, how, what formats we use. And that is what has worked particularly in Uganda. You know, the formats are accessible to customers from a price point perspective. We've increased the range of products and we've increased our execution and our presence and our route to market. So I think for us, it's really saying that the waves come and go but we control what we can control, and that's what's worked for us in the last one year. Uh, Uganda really has been closed on the on-trade the entire year, um, but nobody really knows that because we've just focused on what we can execute, um, and we do that very well. Yeah. Yeah. I was coming through your cash flow statement, and uh, there was quite a bit of an impact in terms of FX in the FY21. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'd imagine this is, uh, was largely in H1 where we saw the shilling going to a tailspin. Or what was the case here? Yeah, so this um, we'd actually explained at half year uh, because that's when the largest impact was. And you will remember sometime towards the end of last year, around October, there was uh, some volatility on the Kenyan currency, uh, scarcity of, of uh, dollars, and, and the rate just seemed to, we almost seemed to have to. Uh, parallel markets and that occurred at a time when we were closing the Serengeti transaction and payments needed to be made and you know the forward market was really quite dead so you couldn't quite get uh, any hedging products at that time given that the conditions so by the time we we're settling that transaction with the volatility in the market we took a bit of a heat on the FX side if you look at half two we, that's been well controlled uh, we've hardly taken anything in half two so we think that that's kind of behind us um, but still very 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 closely keeping an eye on FX and making sure that so that's something that we manage very very closely over the last one year, we have seen EABL leverage the off-trade business as a balancing wheel, considering the sort of dent or impact that the on-trade business has suffered from a price sensitivity optic. How does the off-trade fare vis-a-vis -vis the on-trade business? So, of course, when you're on trade, you're running a facility which has seating space, has televisions, has a lot more. And so there is a bit of a higher price to, to the product than you would on the off-trade. And that has, has, has been an advantage for the off-trade because customers are seeing the same product, much cheaper, very accessible, and they go for it. Having said that, we find that our customers really follow occasions. So they don't just drink because it's cheaper, you know, it's the occasion. And they still enjoy going out, meeting friends, having a drink. It's still a thing that, a thing that people want to do. And so we still see that whenever their own trade is open, the people still go back there and still go and have a drink. And, and I think that's, that's um, just part of our culture and part of who we are. Yeah. There has been talks of EABL going back to the capital markets to raise debt, never mind the earlier redemption sometime this year. Uh, considering especially the capital expenditure that you intend to incur in the next financial year, how does this uh, play out? How, what can you say about this? Yeah, I think, Julius, as I said, you know, we, and one of the things we've done during this period is consistent looking at, looking, consistently looking at our balance sheet, looking at our debt, looking at its structure, looking at the tenor, looking at the rates, which is what drove the early redemption. We still remain very confident in the capital markets as a source of funding. And we, as I said, you know, when the conditions are right, pricing wise, tenor wise, and you know, accessibility, liquidity, then that is something that we always consider. It's never been off the table. It's been part of our, our mix of funding. And you know, it's something that we are consistently looking at. So at the moment, we don't really have anything to report, but it is something that's always on the table for us. If you look at data from the World Bank in terms of alcohol consumption per capita, you will notice that Kenya is considerably low compared to peers such as Tanzania and Uganda. And considering the sort of efforts we have seen EABL undertaking in other markets like TZ and Uganda, don't you think then you should be putting the focus on Kenya because of the headroom it presents in terms of growth as opposed to other markets? 
I think it's twofold. One, Kenya is really low, and that's something that is very much at the core of our strategy. Thinking about, you know, where are those revenue pools that we haven't quite explored, what trends are coming through, and how do we um, access those? So definitely Kenya is part of our growth strategy. I think, as I said, it's just how much headroom we have. If you think about our Serengeti business in Tanzania, five years ago we had one beer, just one beer brand. That's it. You know, so coming from a one beer brand to what we now have, we not only have the Serengeti um, range, we also have Pilsner in there, then we have premium spirits, and now we br brought in uh, mainstream spirits. It's playing across the price point so that customers, when they want a product, they're able to access your product. So there's just a lot more room uh, there, even to get to uh, the offering we have here. Uh, and, and that's where I see the growth is faster there. Here, there's a lot of cultural aspects as well that one has to be cognizant of. And there's also just the element of, are we giving, you know, are we matching the customer to what they really want and putting that on the table? So I think I see growth in all the three spaces. And that's what I say, you know, we, we're gonna grow in Kenya. We're gonna definitely continue to grow. Uh, but as I say, we have, uh, if I look at capacity in Uganda, we were full on. We were producing every little, piece of that plant and it's begging for us to supply the market with more. So that's a clear investment case. Similarly with Tanzania, we've got three breweries completely maxed out of capacity. So of course you're going to put in more there uh, and you've, you're really just running with one or two brands. So there's really room to, to do a lot more. It's been a little over a year since you took over the position of CFO and head of strategy. You took over in May 2020 at a very daunting time when COVID-19 had just hit the country and the government was taking up this restriction of movement measures. How has it been ever since? I think it's great. And I'll say that and I'll just go back to what I said earlier about our reputation. And that has been really comforting for me, not just for the company, the board, we are consistent. We're gonna do the right things. We're gonna do the right things through this season. Uh, and when we look back, we will have done, uh, we will be proud of the things we've done for our staff, for our shareholders, for our employees. I think coming from such a lens is really very important as a company because then you don't do things that are short term in nature and then they're detrimental in the long term. So that keeps us focused. And I think it's given me a lot of um, confidence in our future. I think it's a strong organization. It's got a great culture and we've got really, really strong future prospects. So having the right values on top of that, I think for me, just makes it a lot easier to navigate such a difficult period and still make the right calls. Every shareholder looking at EMBL, uh, one of the risks we have to price in is the potential for regulatory overreach, and that's from a tax perspective. How much does that bother you? Um, it does a lot, and uh, particularly when I talked about in October, looking at you know how to react and get through put in our business we immediately got a five percent five point nine percent increase in excise and you're thinking about your customer who's been hit by inflation jobs are struggling incomes are low and here you are having another five point nine percent inflation in kenya we had digital tax dumps in uganda which cost us just about a billion uh, shillings of additional cost that we had not anticipated and, you know, just um, whilst we talk to the regulators a lot more, uh, because we believe strongly that if we do something that destroys the volumes, it destroys the taxes as well. So the rates may be higher, but the total cash amount of tax is lower. So in the last year, what we did uh, due to COVID, we held price uh, for the most part. In Uganda, we had to take some price, but in Kenya, we held price until June this year. So we only took price towards the end of June. Um, again, because we do expect that, you know, excise will continue to come through and we, we, we uh, absorbed the 5.9% that took place last year. But it was just that recognition of you kill the volumes, you kill the business, you kill the taxes and it's a zero sum game. So it's a conversation we are consistently having with the tax authorities to get that balance right that um, we can contribute better if the tax rates are palatable and they allow consumers to consume more volumes.